Welcome back to The Heat. We're discussing China's footprint in global investment. Joining us uh, in our discussion from London is Linda Yue. She's an adjunct professor of economics at the London Business School and the author of China's Growth, the Making of an Economic Superpower. And we're joined by the rest of our guests as well. Uh, Linda, let me start with you this time. We were talking earlier on about uh, the changing economy in China. China is transitioning from an economy based on manufacturing and exports to one based on domestic consumption. How will China's overseas investments help that transition? It can help it in a very specific way, which is in terms of upgrading China's technology. So one of the keys to China's very challenging transition into an economy which is uh, led much more by productivity, efficiency, which is all very consistent with relying on its own growth drivers rather than in an earlier stage of growth where it relied on export orientation and foreign investors coming into China itself and learning from that process to upgrade its industry. This next phase requires Chinese companies to be more technically advanced, technologically competitive. And if you look at Chinese multinationals, which are competing out in Asia and in the world, Tencent, Alibaba, Huawei, the world's biggest telecoms company, that gives you a flavor of how it is that some of these Chinese companies are trying to show that uh, their wares are as good as perhaps other uh, global companies. And China needs companies like like this to show it can upgrade its economy. And it's not just on the technology and industry side. Another part of important part of China's transformation into an upper middle income country is developing the services sector. So it's not mainly reliant on industry. And services expertise is also much more prevalent in uh, more developed markets, especially in Western Europe and in the United States. So China's outward investment tends to be in these areas, services, financial services, as well as in uh, technology, uh, along with their longstanding investment in, uh, in resources. Um, but now I think the big difference is private companies competing globally. And if we do see a lot of Chinese multinationals, which are as technically competitive as, say, the Apples or the Googles um, of the world, then that would tell you a lot about the success of China's own difficult transformation um, into a uh, upper middle income country, as I say, driven a lot, a lot more by productivity than in the past. And Linda, what about uh, innovation? We've been hearing a lot of talk about innovation, that China has to move from just being a manufacturing center to being one that innovates. Uh, what future do you see for innovation in China? It's key. It's one of the reasons why Chinese firms are so keen to patent, which is one form of measuring formal innovation. So if you look at worldwide, um, the top five patent filers globally in terms of companies, three out of the five are Chinese companies. Now, there is a big task for any country to push for innovation, because innovation, if it were easy to, to do, uh, we're looking at a very different um, economy. And so some of the research that I've done uh, with a colleague at the London School of Economics, we've looked at how much China's innovation comes from uh, technology transfer, so in other words, foreign sources. And a good chunk of it does, up to possibly two-thirds. So that means that Chinese firms domestically uh, innovating without foreign technology, I think, is still a massive challenge. I mentioned a moment ago a few Chinese tech firms like Huawei, um, which um, has been uh, had sat some controversy um, as well in terms of uh, the United States and uh, Australia in terms of um, their relationship with the Chinese state. But I think these kinds of companies are very focused on innovation. They'll spend something like 10 percent of their revenues into their R&D budget. Um, but if you talk to these big companies like I have, what they say uniformly is China needs 50, 100 of these before you could say that um, they have enough innovation, enough uh, domestic uh, capacity to raise um, technical advances right. that improve the overall efficiency of an economy. Um, you can't just look at a handful. Okay. David, let's look at the relationship, uh, investment relationship between China and the United States. The two sides are currently invest, uh, are negotiating a bilateral investment treaty. Um, some sectors will be close to each side, the so-called negative list, as it's called. Now, that treaty will have to be approved by the U.S. Congress. And given the current political climate, do you expect it to be approved? <laughs> 
I think the current political climate is difficult in the United States, but the big issue at the moment is China needs to make a good offer. You know, just this week, China's come with a new offer on the negative list that's confidential. We don't have detailed information, but I'm pretty confident there's still a lot of sectors on that negative list. You know, Linda raised some really interesting, important issues. A lot of these Chinese firms going out are service sector firms and technology firms. And one problem is that China itself remains relatively close to direct investment in those sectors. So China is not allowing real competitive markets to develop in many of those areas, and yet its firms are going out. And this is becoming a problem for partners like the U.S. Uh, U.S. is actually the biggest recipient of China's direct investment if you leave aside Hong Kong. Uh, so a lot of Chinese investments coming to the U.S., but the U.S. side is concerned that there's no reciprocity. So I think if China made a good offer, meaning it would open up most of these sectors, I think the business community in the U.S. could get a bilateral investment treaty through Congress. I don't expect that negotiation to be finished in the next few months, so I don't really have to answer what happens in the next few months. But if there's a good agreement within, say, 12 months, you know, politics in the U.S. are uncertain, but there's a good chance that the business community could get that through whatever Congress emerges from the next election. Right, and Yukon, there is not that uh, great deal of uh, investment from developing countries uh, into China itself. It remains closed to many uh, foreign direct investments. Um, there are some sectors that have opened up because of China's membership of the WTO, but do you think investments into China will grow significantly? Well, I think it will continue to grow. Uh, it's, you go historically, uh, China's export industries were created by foreign investment. And China's uh, money that's coming in from places like Japan, South Korea, Taiwan still remains substantial. Uh, I think a lot more ASEAN money is coming in in many of these developing countries. So I see it as a, a clearly a, a very strong source. Going back to your earlier question about the politics of the, yeah. the investment treaties, in some ways it's less sensitive than trade issues. Trade issues are highly politicized here in, in the United States. But with the bilateral investment treaty, you have a situation where the American economy is relatively open and the Chinese economy is relatively restricted. So a, an agreement which opens up China to the United States will be politically very welcome and also be in China's interest. So I see this as a very positive thing. But there are also sensitive issues. There's issues about technology transfer, concerns about intellectual property rights protection. And these are also very sensitive issues in China. So if you can get these things correct, I think both sides can see this as potentially a so-called win-win possibility. More so, frankly speaking, than trade, which has become much more of a contentious issue in the global environment. Yeah, go ahead, Charles. I think that uh, if the United States uh, learned a little bit from the UK on how to engage in a constructive fashion with China, the US businesses would make a lot more money. It would be much more profitable. R you know, rather than trying to isolate China in the AIB or uh, in the TPP, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the UK has become the largest and uh, Chinese business partner in Europe. And I think that if the United States were to have such agreements with China to open up both sides, I think that uh, American business would be the first to profit more. Linda, there has been some criticism uh, of China with regard to environmental and social safeguards. What are your views with this regard? especially when it comes to China's investments in the developing world? Um, I think there is a real question as to whether or not a investor into a developing country in particular um, should come with higher standards than what that country itself is able to, um, uh, able to implement. So I think there is a debate to be had around investment rules, which at the moment, um, globally, there aren't really any hard and fast ones, but there are standards which um, around the environment, around labor, um, which I think that lots of developing countries uh, would, would probably ultimately benefit um, if they were to embrace them. So I think that is an area that I wouldn't single out China, but given how big it is as an investor, there is an opportunity there to, to lead by um, example, I think. Right. What is your view on that, David? I think the Chinese attitude of going in and following the rules and regulations of the country it's in it has a certain logic. Uh, but as Linda said, you know, we've got many developing countries. Some of them have relatively weak implementation of their own stepping stones. 
So I think it is a good business practice to bring higher standards. Recently, some of China's agencies, like Ministry of Commerce, have put out recommendations you know, that China bring higher standards into its projects. At the moment, that's a recommendation. I think it's a good step forward. Uh, I think Chinese companies will learn that it's in their interest to have good corporate social responsibility. Right, and uh, on that, uh, Yukon, how do you see Chinese investment, global investment strategy evolving? Well, in terms of these standards, first of all, let's, let's differentiate the AIIB, which is a multilateral agency. So it has standards and its initiatives very similar to what you see in the World Bank and ADB. And I think that's a very good thing. Other Chinese sources of funding, China Development Bank, Export Import Bank, have generally not been paying much attention to these areas. But as David says, it's probably a good thing for them to be more conscious of it. Because the problems pop up later. And both sides actually suffer from the consequences of not having looked at it. I think the critical difference between a Chinese approach and, let me say, a Western approach is whether or not the Chinese are more willing to work with the recipients to try to get to better standards rather than trying to set a very black and white line. Because among developing countries, you have a wide variation in their ability to implement these standards. So I think that's one thing that's going to be different about, about Chinese funds overseas. All right, Charles, I just want to get back to one other specific project. I think which, one yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I think one very uh, distinct difference between the uh, Western approach and the Chinese approach is that the United States and Europe basically uh, ha have strings attached. You know, uh, if you can get their money if you behave in a certain way at your own home, where the Chinese uh, basically would like to know whether the business is good, profitable, or the investment can yield a return and really don't really care to interfere into the internal affairs of other countries. Now, in Brazil, the environmental laws are very, very strict, and the Chinese companies have been following, adhering to the standards. Uh, Linda, how unusual is it for a developing country to become the world's biggest investor in other developing nations? Very unusual. Um, but I would just talk it up to another trait of China, which is pretty unique. I mean, how unusual is it for the world's second biggest economy us to be still um, a barely a middle income uh, country on an average income basis? So I think in that sense, um, it's, quite, uh, it's quite something, it's quite promising that um, development, uh, which we consider to be, say, South-South links, um, is actually one of the uh, the big changes in the world as opposed to developed countries investing in developing uh, countries. So I think in that sense, China is part of this whole uh, change in emerging markets. But in terms of how China treats its investment, um, I have uh, spoken with African economists, for instance, about this issue. And one of the uh, one of the things that China itself very successfully did, which was to gain uh, foreign investment via joint ventures, which allowed it to learn from working alongside foreign companies. That kind of uh, technology transfer is part of that, but that just kind of informal learning by doing is actually a very important part of how it is that countries learn from better practices globally and lift themselves and grow better. And I think in terms of Africa, uh, that's something that there are hopeful for from Chinese investment because China certainly did it itself. But in some cases, I've heard um, that hasn't been the case. So I think in that way, um, there is still quite a lot to, uh, to develop in terms of what it means for uh, China as a developing country to invest in these countries because it does bring um, these issues to the table. And that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for joining us.